Hi, I'm Ralph Preston. Usually we meet on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, but today we're meeting on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and that's so we can accommodate our hardworking guest, uh, Tom Haynes, who uh, is in England, and it's after work for him, and he runs his own uh, physiotherapy company, as they say in, in England. Um, Tom's a senior PT. Um, he employs a number of people, has a thriving um, PT business, and uh, we're lucky to, that he's willing to talk to us today. So um, I guess the first thing, Tom, I usually ask, because <coughs> I'm an empathetic person, and I think there's some empathy involved in helping other people, so I always find it interesting how, how somebody ended up being a PT or a neurologist or whatever. So what was it in your life that um, drove you to become a PT? And if you want to tell a little bit about the story of how you did it, that that's fine too. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me, Ralph. It's a pleasure to come and uh, speak with Stroke Buddies and share some knowledge. Um, my journey to becoming a PT started as a uh, young teenager when I was involved in a car accident. And um, I, I, I can't remember, we were, we were stationary at the, at the lights and um, a car came right racing down about 60 miles per hour and impacted the, the rear end of um, our, at the time, my dad's sports car and the, the seat detached forwards and I ended up getting a spinal injury. Um, not a complete spinal cord transection, so I, I didn't lose permanent abilities in any legs, but I, I lost temporary ability because of the swelling in my spinal cord. Um, and I had to learn to walk again. And it was through neurophysio that I learned to do that. And I think from that moment, it kind of solidified, in my mind, the type of career I want to do. And then, you know, fast forward through the educational system and going to university or college, as you'd call it, and, and gaining my qualification. Um, I then specialised immediately into, into neurophysio. Um, and most... Most PTs in, in the UK, we, 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 typically, we typically divert to the National Health Service, um, which is our kind of um, universal healthcare system um, that, that I kind of specialised uh, as a junior physio at first on, on neurological rotations as sort of different departments. And then um, gradually within a relatively short space of time, just over a year, just decided to specialize primarily in stroke rehabilitation and and after four or five years of seniorship i i opened um tmh physiotherapy which is a the physio business that we have today great great um you know um we're going to talk a little bit about uh well spasticity but botox in relation to spasticity um today um so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of your experiences with um, Botox and spasticity and uh, your patients and, and uh, what you think about what you've yeah. seen. Okay, well, I think the, the, the name of this chat as well, Botox, does it work? I thought that was a really good um, description because I think it highlights one of the key issues with Botox is that on face value, does Botox work? And I think what the, a lot of clinicians from, from, from medical doctors all through to PTs is that they, they look at it too simplistically. Does Botox work to do what it says on the tin? Yes, it reduces spasticity. It reduces muscle pain related to spasticity in that format. Because obviously there's, there's all different types of high tone. Um, but spasticity in particular is particularly effective at reducing. But does it work for the patient in the way that the patient feels like it should? Then that's where the debate really lies, because a lot of the research will argue that, yeah, it can reduce spasticity. Does it effectively improve functional outcomes, movement, power in the arm that you've had that injection in? Does it facilitate better rehabilitation? No, not particularly. Um, and you can find lots of um, 
systematic reviews, lots of meta control trials that can that can show you that evidence that it's good for pain, that it's good for passive range of motion, the ability for a limb to move more freely at rest, but does it in, assist the brain in being able to rewire and reorganize to give that limb function again? The answer is, is it's not sure, but it's leaning to the side of no. Um, and I think this herein lies the problem because I feel that with Botox being the first line of treatment for focal, so localized spasticity in a limb, and that's kind of in the UK, it's the first line of treatment. And I can presume it's the first line of treatment in the States as well. Um, it's often prescribed and given, I, I believe, far too early. Um, and I think it's because we're in the culture of, you know, you see a symptom, you treat a symptom. So they see spasticity and they want to treat it immediately. Um, and this is this is the problem because we need to understand that the emergence of spasticity, the reasons it's there, um, the best ways to get rid of it is is to actually facilitate neurological recovery because the spasticity is response to denervation, the brain not connecting back to the spinal cord. So the more we can reconnect the brain through rehabilitation, the need for Botox. Um, is not as uh, as apparent as what it as what it once was thought to be. So well, I, I heard it's good for passive motion. Of course, most people yeah. out there know what passive motion is. That's opening your hand with your other hand, or moving your arm, or raising your arm with your other other hand. Uh, the other thing I heard was that it doesn't seem to have any effect on for lack of a better word, neuroplasticity, the, you know, the connections that that would have to come from you doing passive motion and maybe some kind of visual imagery or something to make those kind of connections that yeah. Botox as a drug itself doesn't, d doesn't facilitate, um, connections that you, no, something that's you, correct. you would have to do. Because what one thing we do is, you know, everybody who gets, says I'm getting Botox, if they're a newbie, we tell them, you know, make sure you do your OT or your PT because otherwise, you know, in six or eight weeks, you go or three months or however long it lasts with you, you go back to being frozen. And the only way you can get any kind of benefit out of it is to try and get passive motion and then try and get some active motion somehow. Yeah. So, yeah. Talk a little bit more about spasticity. When we talked uh, initially, you know, you were talking a little bit about that there's a reason for spasticity. I think this ties into your thing about that's often given far too early. By the way, when you said that, I thought of AFOs. Here we slap an AFO on your on your foot and inject you with PT and say, I mean, with um, Botox and say, good luck. Getting better yeah. before your insurance <laughs> runs out. We have a yeah. big problem with insurance running out here that you may or may not have um, as badly in the UK with socialized medicine. But that's a can of worms topic for another yeah. day. That could be another day, yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about like why spasticity exists and how you um, should look at it and... Uh, I even got the Im impression that you could utilize it. it uh, that may be too strong of a word in, in your recovery. Um, facilitate. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think to break that up into two questions, um, okay. what, why does spasticity occur in the first place? So what's important to understand is that whilst you have a, a strip of your brain, on each side that, that helps to activate particular muscles in you know voluntary muscles in any of your limbs called your motor cortex. That's one uh, motor system that you have um, that enables you to, to move around, enables movement. Um, you have multiple other motor systems and they respond muchly, much at a subconscious level and automatically and they originate not from the brain itself but they can originate from lower down the brain um so at the below your brain you've got something called your brain stem before you connect to your spinal cord and you have four four yeah one two three four motor systems that descend from the brain stem 
And those are activated in response not to voluntary effort to move, but those are activated in response to um, uh, things such as your um, feedback from your limbs about your position. They respond to the relationship of stretch on your neck muscles. Uh, they respond to your inner ear function and the position of your inner ears, your what's called your vestibular system, your balance centers. We all know that, you know, the people say your balance centers is in your, in your ears and it's true to a large degree. Um, uh, and the, the act of maintaining what's called your postural control, your upright activity, is not coordinated in large part by the brain where the majority of people have their stroke. And effectively what happens is when you experience a stroke in the motor cortex, you lose the voluntary movement at the point of stroke, um, but you still have activity in those pathways that descend from below the brain. And those pathways are such that when they're not being opposed and when they're not being worked against by the, the, the brain having connection to the spine, they kind of run wild. And um, the way that they're all lined up in how they connect to specific muscle groups is they typically promote what we call decorticate patterning or posturing. And to you, that would be um, the characteristic kind of flexed arm, pronated hand, grip fingers. Um, and for the leg, what's uh, you get an extended, so a straight knee, uh, an adducted, a leg that scissors across the middle. Um, and a what's called a quinovarus of the foot, which is like a push down of the toes and a turning in, in of the toes. So that that set of posture is called decorticate posturing. And the, the cause is you lose motor cortex connection to the spinal cord and your other motor systems that that would naturally balance against are now overactive. So um, a bit like a seesaw that balances the activity. When you've had a stroke that's lost this side, the other becomes more dominant and that leads to this involuntary activity that we know as spasticity wow really? yeah <laughs> it's easier with a diagram <laughs> oh no 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 i got it i think it, I, yeah i understand um, it so now the reason uh, it can be very effective um spasticity um early in rehabilitation what we want to be able to do is to to maximize mobility and performance of a patient so in terms of lower limb spasticity extensor tone in particular the straightening of the leg um is actually quite useful at helping someone to regain the ability to sit to stand um it's also really useful when re-educating walking because if your limb's not floppy but when your limb hits the floor it straightens even if it's involuntarily it can support your weight enough for you to then step your non-affected side through. So um, whilst a purist school of thought would be uh, quality of movement, um, which would be kind of anti-spasticity, the, the more modern approaches to rehabilitation and what we call Carr and Shepherd or movement science approach tends to value the input of spasticity in allowing someone to, to ambulate again. So particularly in the early stages, it, it can be quite useful to facilitate movement interesting interesting so if um somebody's on been being given botox um what would your advice be to them in terms of the therapy that they could and should do um uh <clears throat> in terms of um uh, facilitating, I guess, voluntary movement. Obviously, you're going to have to move through some progression to get there. You know, of course, everybody, you know, when they hear, well, I'm not sure Botox works, they want to go, you know, especially people who are getting it now. There are a lot of people who kind of swear by it because it does loosen up um, sub, um, muscles. Um, yeah, I had a couple of people on the when I promoted this meeting, a couple of people come on and say, yeah, my husband gets it and it allows him to open his fingers. And I said, well, make sure he does his OT because yeah. otherwise it's going to freeze back up. So yeah. it's my understanding, maybe you can clarify this for me as well as the group. It's my understanding, I guess that would be passive that to begin with, that um, Botox really doesn't do anything except uh, loosen you up and there's no... Um, connectivity really going on so it seems important to go through some kind of um, progression 
to get some benefit from it while you're loosened up. Yeah. Um, so you're right. The way that the Botox works, first of all, is, is when it's injected uh, into, into your high tone, your spastic muscles, as we would call them. Um, what, what it does is the chemical prevents the nerve endings that attach to your muscle fibers from releasing a, a chemical called acetyl acetylcholine. And that is what your muscle used to then um, initiate the cascade of events that allow contractions. So effectively, it paralyzes any form of signal from the nerve, the end of the nerve reaching the muscle fibers. That's the way that it works. Um, so it's locally acting. It's not systemic like uh, baclofen or tizanidine or diazepam. It doesn't you don't consume it and it affects the entirety of oneself. It just affects the, the locally injected area. Um, so it, by par effectively paralyzing the muscles that are high tone, it enables more passive movement because the, the, the resting tension has gone. So you're able to then stretch the hand or stretch the foot back. Um, the problem that we face is that passive movement is great for minimizing pain and for preventing contractures and allowing better function overall because if you think if you've got a, a, a high tone flexed arm against your chest it's very difficult to do activities of daily living so it can be very hard to do things like uh, get washed get dressed um balance even if, if your center of gravity is adjusted by your arm being over so there's benefits on that side of things from a whole person's perspective. But from the pure limbs perspective, you're actually, particularly in the early stages, if you're paralyzing the connection between the nervous system and the muscle, then even when you're attempting to then reestablish normal motor control from the brain down, the brain can't activate the muscle either. So this is, this is the thing where it has to be balanced. Because if we, spasticity is a reaction to the stroke, it's a reaction to the damage. Spasticity will naturally reduce, it will reach its highest point and reduce as long as the brain is making attempts to reestablish connection back to the limb. Um, so the best way to use spasticity is to teach movement within the spastic muscles to then lower the tone in those muscles. Um, so what I would always say is that early spasticity is almost always not a good idea. Um, I think you should at least be waiting at least six to eight weeks before you consider spastics, before you consider Botox. Your brain needs a chance to try to, through rehabilitation, establish connectivity back to the limb um, before you, you remove effectively or reduce the chance of that happening with, with, with Botoxing the limb. Um, but for a chronic stroke patient, someone that's had a stroke and, you know, it's now six, seven months down the line um, and their arm is still completely locked against them and there's no even flickers of voluntary movement at that point, Botox is a very good idea. So it's just knowing when you say Botox, does it work? It's knowing it does, but does it work for you and at the point at which you think you need it? So... What I'm hearing is that there's a part of a natural progression with spasticity that has to do with the way your brain heals. Yeah. Now, I, I, I don't know. I've never done a survey or asked a lot of people or whatever, but just my impression from the stroke groups is most of the people are not getting it at four to six weeks. They're getting it more like six months or they're second go around with uh, occupational therapy i'm sure there's somebody out there who you know got it that that quickly but it it uh well i mean there i guess the approval process has gotten better for it mm. uh in the beginning uh, you know a lot of insurance companies wouldn't pay for it so that was an issue and that would typically um delay it um because of you know when insurance companies pay for things and everybody knows that, then they become part of a, a regimen uh, uh, more more readily than if they're still kind of on the outside. So yeah. what I'm hearing is that Botox works, but you have to manage it in some way to make it work for you. Yeah, you have to know what what is the desired outcome that you have as a patient 
or having Botox. Because if your desired outcome is pain management, if it's passive range of movement, and if it's in improving your ability with a hemiplegic limb to do functional activities of daily living, just perform them, not necessarily get the limb to work more, just to tolerate your daily life better, then Botox is probably a good idea. If you are starting to re-establish movement in the limb and you're still quite actively working on um, getting a limb to voluntarily move and you haven't got pain and the spasticity is at a level where you can self-stretch it out whenever you need to, it might go back. But if you can self-stretch it and maintain it with, let's say, soft, um, soft splints or with um, rolled up towels or pillows, then I would probably say you need to wait longer. You need to try to re-establish movement before you almost prevent that from being able to happen. I found, um, of course, when I had my stroke, I knew very little about strokes. I knew nothing about spasticity. I don't think I heard the term for a few years after my stroke. Um, because I typically don't explain things to you. I kind of force people to explain things to me. You know, typically here they'll just tell you, okay, here's your exercises that, you know, that you should be doing. Um, but I found that I started with passive movement. And then when I started to get, I'd use mental imagery. I'm a big believer in mental imagery or mental practice when you're doing passive motion. I would assume you are. I'd be interested in your opinion on that. But what I tell people to do is if you're having to passively move, try and use your brain to think about it. Um, because I, I, well, I got my hand back by staring at it and moving it a sixteenth of an inch and then building on that. Once you get voluntary motion, almost my experience personally and with several people I've worked with, um, once you start getting even the smallest amounts of voluntary motion, then um, you can build on it. And I found that, I, I guess I went through the natural, uh, uh, I don't know, the Brunson stages of the natural progression of spasticity. And I found once I got some voluntary movement, like in my arm, I'd have a bump here. So I worked that bump. And then when I got the whole thing through the whole range of motion, I started seeing the spasticity decrease when I got strong. When I got, you know, strong to where you couldn't, I could pull your ar ar arm up with mine or push, push away. When I got strong throughout that entire range of motion, my spasticity pretty much went away. Went away, yeah. It's interesting because I did a, um, a, I followed four patients with a neurologist at the Medical University of South Carolina uh, in a Botox study. We, I followed them for about a year and uh, when I first went in to talk to him about the project, I, I explained that to him and he said, you mind, he looked skeptically at me, he said, you mind if I examine you? And I went, in my head, I went, free exam for a neurologist? Sure, go ahead. And he went around and he tapped me with his little red rubber hammer everywhere and he said, you have no spasticity. He just said, Chinese, Dr. Uh, Wee Wu Feng. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, he said, you have no spasticity. I said, yeah, I know. He said, how'd you get rid of it? I said, I told you. So that, that seemed to work for me. Um, they, they weren't Wait, using Botox 15 years ago. They were only uh, using it for maybe headaches and for cosmetic purposes, but they yeah. weren't using it in, uh, in stroke recovery, especially. Yeah. So you kind of personally experienced the same thing that I'm trying to advocate for is that the spasticity emerges as part of a natural response to the brain damage from a stroke. It then intensifies as you start to reestablish some kind of uh, base connection to, that, to, the, to, to the spinal cord when the first signs of neurogenesis, new nerves start to develop and new connections start to develop. It usually exaggerates at that point. Then it's a case of working to get movement within the spastic pattern once you start to get voluntary movement on top of the contractions, then then the spasticity will naturally reduce. You'll probably have noticed that when you're recovering and when most of you recover, you start to develop movement in a very, to you probably seems quite a random sequence, but to me, it's an it's expected sequence. 
So with arms, the most typical movement that comes back first is the ability to pull the arm across the middle of the chest and elevate the elbow slightly out to the side like this, um, followed by usually elbow bending and gripping. Um, you wouldn't, most people following a stroke that involves complete paralysis of one limb with the emergence of muscle tone, they very rarely, if ever, develop the ability to just reach their arm up and out to the side like this or push away, pushing motions. They, they can't do it. Punching. Yeah. Punching is, is incredibly difficult. It always comes after you've developed the ability to pull. You can always pull first before you push. Yeah. You always grip and pull before you can push. And, and there's a reason for that. It, it, it's that that's the pulling motions is, is what the spasticity is actually generating. So you learn to impose the spasticity. You learn to contract the spastic muscles first, followed by the ability for the spasticity to relax and then move in the opposite direction. So the risk you have is if you, if you Botox these muscles and you paralyze them effectively, then no matter, no matter how much mental imagery you give, if you Botox my arm, it will paralyze my arm. I won't be able to move it no matter how hard I'm willing it to try. Um, so the, the analogy that you've got to think of is that I think about it is Botox is like getting in your car and there's no fuel tank in there and expecting it to run because you're trying to turn the key. <laughs> it's, it's just never going to turn on. Yeah, because with, with Botox, you're removing the fuel. The gas is gone. You can't, you can't turn the thing on. So you can will it, you can turn the key, you can hit the pedals and it just won't drive because you took the fuel out. So that, that's the best way to think about it. So before you do take the fuel out, because the car's wild and you, it's going to crash every turn, which is the high tone that's no movement, give it chance for you to learn to control that car first and then see if you can not need to then remove the fuel, take the Botox approach. Uh, I think, you know, again, this is my impressions. I'm, <clears throat> I'm a member of like eight, 18 groups and, I, and I'm in at least three or four pretty regularly. And most people consider spasticity an evil. And, yeah, they, nice. <laughs> and, and, they, and they want to use Botox to kill it, to shoot it dead. And yeah. you know, what I'm hearing is that, that I guess you got, you got too much it stuff. has some, uh, some positive aspects. But the most important thing it would be this, um, this whole management thing. Another thing I find yeah. is that, like I said, most people um, uh, end up that I see posting and talking about it, uh, don't end up getting it early. Um, it's oftentimes like, well, we've tried everything else. Well, you know, it's kind of like not quite a last ditch effort, but, you know, getting close um, to that. And uh, yeah. most people, uh, when you're talking about the desired result, what most people want is they've, you know, they've got a, you know, a bit of a claw Oh, I shouldn't be doing that with my affected hand. I, I think it's, I personally think it's a bad idea to demonstrate spasticity mm -hmm. and stuff with your affected hand, no matter how out you, how far out you are. Anyway, most people have got a, a wrist that looks like that and a hand that looks like that, and maybe an errant figure, finger or two going like that, and they can't do much with it. So a lot of the people I see are, you know, would, would they would describe their hands as a claw and they just want to get it open and they think Botox is just going to magically open it for them. And, you know, I mean, way before I met you, I knew that, you know, that it doesn't do anything because when I followed those four people in the study, one of them really did their PT, one of them really didn't, and the other two were in the middle. Well, at the end of four months or three months for the second shot, I followed him through two or three shots for about a year. The person who was doing more physical therapy, I mean, I watched with a protractor, I watched the OT measure his, you know, elbow um, extension, flexion. Yeah. Extension. Extension, not flexion. Um, and um, he did better than the people who didn't do as much PT. And the doctor actually asked them as a part of the whole thing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I saw that the people that did their work, and then I started reading articles, and, you know, Flint Rehab's got a good one on PT, and I mean, on Botox and OT. And it, it basically says the same thing. If you don't 
if you don't do anything, you just sit around and go back to the way you were. So yeah, I think maybe the difference then is the time that, that Botox is given, because there's there's in our country, um, it's used often as the first line of treatment, and accessibility to it is quite rapid. So if you're an inpatient and you're on a rehabilitation ward, let's say two to three weeks post stroke, you go to a rehabilitation ward, the consultants come and do their rounds and uh, the physicians do, and they, they've got ready access to Botox and they'll just Botox you right there. Um, so maybe really? that's the difference. Yeah, so we have probably, by the sounds of things, a lot more earlier intervention with it. So you can see why my opinion at that stage is quite, let's not do that, let's give this, this limb a chance to move better first. Where's like I said, I'm not. I, I support both. Sorry, sorry, Ralph. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay, I, I support Botox for long-term spasticity. It's very effective at improving quality of life for people who are who are a few months after stroke, because whilst the brain can continue to learn to develop movements, its capacity to do so is much reduced the further out you are from the stroke. It's just slower. So on the balance of managing the symptoms of of um, uncontrolled spasticity the pain the discomfort the lack of functional ability versus the the the, the benefits of some little bit more movement sometimes it's better for your quality of life to take the botox option so i think the long term strokes those that, that, that are months out it's a it's a good shout if you're still not having spasticity that can be controlled conservatively because obviously the thing we would recommend first would be um non-medical non-pharmacological things so it would be stretching techniques it would be manual therapy it would be uh, sock splinting serial casting um it would be weight bearing exercises um uh, what, what else would we do um heat and pressure compression devices so air splints things like that because um, you can manage spasticity and often get a, a carryover for a few hours before it starts to return. So if it's if it's at a level where you can manage it with physical intervention, I would always say choose that. It's We're talking about spasticity in your instance where the hand just can't open or it's just too painful to even try and pull the fingers open. Maybe there's neuropathic pain that goes along with the spasticity. In such instances, the, Botox is a good idea because it's a good opportunity for you to then open the hand although passively and probably won't ever be actively at that point you at least maintain your quality of life with, with with the botox right um it seems to me from observation that we get out the baclofen right away instead of the botox <laughs> and a lot of times do you oh wow yeah <laughs> I, I i don't but uh, i didn't oh, yeah, don't you, you don't have a store of baclofen just <laughs> just that you hand out to people then ralph yeah, well, a lot of a lot of people and are on baclofen. People end up with baclofen pumps. Um, yeah. I have a friend that I worked with. We taught him how to walk after a spinal cord injury. Broke C five, C six. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so with, with spinal cord injuries, we have intrathecal baclofen pumps. So we don't typically see them with strokes, though. Oh, we are do. You strokes as well. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, everybody out there has read a post on baclofen pumps nod their head and raise their hand. I've seen, I've seen fifty. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never in ten years I've never seen a stroke patient in this country with a baclofen pump. That's interesting. See, what we've got is you know, the, um, this is fascinating because what we've got is different approaches going on, which basically means that we've got like two different studies. I mean, if you want to study baclofen, you could look at US patients and UK patients, and you've sort of almost got two test groups. What, what I see with Botox is um, people don't get it. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a first line. Uh, you know, again, I didn't have anything 15 years ago, and I'm not a current stroke survivor, so I'm not currently, well, I don't have any spasticity. So, I'm not currently being treated, so I, I, I don't pretend to you know, know what they're doing um, today, but it seems like they don't pull out, the, it doesn't seem to me that uh, PTs and OTs have it near the top of their list. Uh, what I see is mostly um, 
desperate uh, stroke survivors with a, a claw and a wrist who, who want to get some movement back. And they, um, they say they've tried everything. Of course, you know, I've worked with people in person who say they did certain things and I knew they didn't because they would tell me they did their homework and if they were doing weight bearing, their heel would go down a little teeny bit every every week, wouldn't it? And when it yeah. doesn't go down at all, it kind of indicates to me that you're not doing your homework. So they yeah. say they've done everything, but then they get desperate and, uh, you know, we see a lot of posts like, Anybody get their hand back after a year or two years? Everybody raised their hand who's seen one of those. Every hand will go up. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting the 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 difference. I think yeah. the the main thing maybe for us to talk about here is you know have and we have some, but would be to stick to the subject of you know, how does spasticity work? How does Botox work? And how do you maximize it um, for uh, your particular desired outcome? Because mm -hmm. there are people like, uh, I, I know some people with extreme spasticity that uh, basically nothing works on. She's not here today, but Polly Hutchinson has it. And I wasn't aware of extreme spasticity. And she educated me on it by invited me to come to her physical therapy. She was in Richmond, Virginia. I was visiting my brother and had to drive through Richmond. So I spent a couple hours with her. And uh, I learned that uh, I was a very lucky person to as bad as my stroke was and my spasticity was and what it took to work through it. And, you know, by the way, I didn't do that in like, you know, half an hour, twice a week or anything. I was doing 10 hours a day and I would do, uh, hand uh, three to four times a day for 45 minutes. I do arm and shoulder three or four times a day and I walk five or six times a day. So I was doing a lot of passive and a lot of mental imagery and such. It doesn't just, I mean, everybody here knows that, you know, you don't get better uh, once or twice a week at, at, the, at the PT. Uh, we kind of preach like it's kind of like a piano lesson. You don't count when you when you're taking your piano lesson, you don't count that as practice time. So think about that in terms of your recovery too. When you see the PT, it's like a piano lesson. It's not like, you know, practice time because if you're having a good, I would assume that you do this with your patients. I, I feel like if you're having a good relationship with the PT, you're doing a lot of back and forth and talking and tell people if you're not talking close to half the time, then you you haven't got them in, in, engaged and um, so how, um, I was going to say how do we you know better manage spasticity but I just got through describing that there's a whole range of people so I guess it would it would uh, vary it would be a prescription based on that you would have or a PT would have to make based on you know, feeling a limb and stuff. Um, I've worked with 16 local stroke survivors and I feel a lot differently if I can open somebody's hand or move their shoulder or, or touch them than I, than I do when I watch a video of them walking or moving their hand because I don't have any kind of mechanical uh, feedback from them. Um, so... Well, where would we go with this? Let's see. How do you know how bad is there a way of knowing how bad your spasticity is? A way of testing it or knowing, you know, what approach you should take to it? Or is yeah. that something that the PT? No, 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 definite ways. So the, the, the scale that we use to assess spasticity in a muscle is something called the modified Ashworth scale. Um, and I think it's it's used globally. Um, and it, it's a scale that's scored from, from zero to four, four being the highest that you can achieve on that scale. And it measures the resistance of a muscle to sudden passive stretch. Um, I won't go through the individual gradings, but effectively, um, you, you can take any, any limb across a joint, stretch it. You can assess the response. You can grade it. Um, so there's two ways. There's one way, which is to, which is to assess basicity individually at a specific muscle. 
And then you can look at spasticity as a whole of how does it affect a whole limb? Does it affect multiple muscles or does it just affect one really bad? Um, from there, you can kind of make a judgment of what's the best treatment approach for that patient. Is it going to be focal stretching and localized treatment approaches, which Botox would fall into that category of focal treatment? So uh, Botox would be suggested for a limb that's only highly spastic across one or two joints. So you would only typically give it for like an overly bent, like you said, an overly flexed wrist or an overly tightened elbow. Um, but if you've got spasticity through the entire of the arm and through the entire of the leg as well, you can't just go around, you know, banging in 50 cc's of Botox in 50 muscles. <laughs> That's not what would happen, which is why when we would prescribe um, baclofen at that point. Mm. So our way, of, our model of assessing is if the spasticity is localized um, and it's longer term, then we would promote Botox use. Um, if the spasticity is, is widespread, um, then we would promote more of an oral related antispasmodic, whether that be baclofen, tizanidine or, or a benzodiazepine type drug. Um, and that's what's used in that case. Um, but for spasticity, even if it's widespread or focal, if it's at the point where it can be moved against resistance, which would on an Ashworth scale, we'd grade it like a two to a two plus. If you're at that with the muscle, even if it affects all the muscles on one side, I would basically say that the best approach is conservative. It's going to be regular stretching. It's going to be regular PT. It's going to be trying to do exercise therapy to reestablish motor control. Um, and all the other things, so air splints, um, soft splinting, passive range devices that you can sleep with, things like that is what I would is what would be suggested. So it's Ashworth, like A S H W O R T H. Yeah, A S H W O R T H. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we call it the modified Ashworth scale. Well. See, one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, we can't turn into PTs and OTs, although we try and learn as much as we can about it. So maybe somebody else has to assess that. But that's really good information because what, you know, um, oh, I know of a neurologist in, in, a, in another group uh, for an, a, a different condition, MG, but, um, and that person can't prescribe as a doctor but to people in the group but one thing they can do is and they uh, they do this with a friend of mine was they they gave her seven questions she should ask her a neurologist so what we're kind of doing here is i see that as valuable information from you because the people here are trying they may not be trying to become an ot but they're trying to learn about their enough about their condition and what works and what doesn't work to ask their OT appropriate questions. So um, mm. I've not heard of a spasticity assessment before, so that might be a, 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 a good idea to, um, to do one with your OT or PT so that you have yeah. some idea what, you, what you're dealing with. So Yeah, I mean, a spasticity assessment would be a passive range of movement assessment where the patient would be in the most relaxed position as possible. And we would go through each joint within a limb and test its, first of all, passive range with extremely slow movement to not elicit spasticity. Because spasticity is what's called, it's a velocity dependent form of tone. Right. So, for example, in a condition such as Parkinson's disease, you have what's called rigidity. So it's high tone that's, that's present even at rest and regardless of the movement that's occurring in the body, it's ever present. With spasticity, it's worsened by rapid movement of that limb. So, uh, which is why you inherently, incidentally get things what's called clonus. So you might have noticed when you had spasticity, Ralph, or you know, some of the people on here went, yeah, yeah, yeah. So their wrist would do the beating or their foot would do the beating on the floor. Um, and that's that's a that's a spasticity response as well. So, point being is you need to make sure that it's spasticity for a start, um, because when you have strokes, it, we would make the assumption it's spasticity. When actually, if you have what's called subcortical strokes, so infarcts around an area of your brain called your basal ganglia or your thalamus, you you can develop rigidity in other forms of high tone, which wouldn't be managed the same as spasticity. 
So, first of all, it would be determining that it is spasticity. Um, secondly, you would test it, like I said, slowly through each range, and then you would apply a rapid stretch, and you would see what the response is and grade it using the Ashworth scale. Uh, that's the second part of a spasticity assessment. I think a third part would be doing reflex testing, so seeing how strong your reflexes are, because majority of stroke patients are what's called hyper-reflexive. So you, you could even tap it with a, often tap tendons with fingers in high spastic patients and their limbs will jump up. Um, meanwhile, that would be an abnormal response in, in your unaffected side. So we would, we would do a reflex test and also look for what's called upper motor neuron signs as well. So you, some of you may have had something called a Balbinski test where they scratch the undersurface of your foot and see what your toes do. I don't know if you've ever had that. Or they might grab your hand and grab your middle finger and flick the end of your finger to see what your thumb does. Uh, so we look for these involuntary spastic reflexes as well. Uh, and all of that builds a picture of how much spasticity affects this limb. So we need to determine how widespread it is. So that's the first part of an assessment. And then to what intensity is the spasticity? Because the intensity and in how widespread it is can be a mixture of, of different extremes. You can have very widespread spasticity that's of a very low intensity, yet you can have very focal spasticity that affects maybe one or two muscles that's incredibly severe. Um, and that will dictate how you will look at not only therapy approaches to the treatment, but it will also influence the cascade of decisions around what medical management is provided. Yeah, that, that's what I'm hearing. I think that most people, most stroke survivors, if you ask them, they have like kind of a, they, they think spasticity is one thing. It's kind of similar for everybody. And that's uh, <clears throat> what I'm hearing. I knew before that that was not the case, but what I'm hearing is that it's a lot more complex than I previously thought or, and yeah. way more complex than most uh, stroke survivors. Um, but isn't it easy to just give you some baclofen and some Botox, though? <laughs> yeah, and uh, take two of these and call me in the morning. Uh, there you go. It's easy. That, 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 that's where a lot of um, you know treatment options come from. That same kind of uh, thinking, you know. Uh, we, uh, I think, everywhere in the world, we jump to pharmaceuticals awful, awful quick. Yeah, and you know these these drugs, they they're not magic drugs. They they cause their own problems. You know, baclofen, you might think I've got widespread spasticity. It means that I can't function properly. So I'll take baclofen. Uh, that's fine. It will drop your tone. But the risk you have with strokes is it's a, it's a systemic drug. It affects all muscles, not just your skeletal muscles. So it will affect your, your swallow ability as well in, in high enough doses. So if you're already on modified diet or thickened fluids from your speech therapist, your speech and language, well, I don't know what you do in the States. We have speech and language therapists that deal with swallowing and speech. So I don't know whether you have the same. Same but, here, um, SLPs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so if they've got you on a modified diet and you start taking baclofen, it can throw your swallow off and you're at risk of aspirating and getting pneumonia. So, you know, baclofen has that effect. It also... Um, interferes with kidney function so it can it can damage your kidneys long term as well um it can cause other side effects you know nausea vomiting dizziness you would hope um, they're all working together though you would you would think that they'd all be talking to each other well that's what i was getting ready to say i don't know if they do a better job in england than they do here but we don't do a very good job of uh, of, of the doc the doctors don't talk to each other the, to my knowledge um that's one of the things why we kind of preach that you kind of, that you need to become your own patient advocate because oftentimes you have to carry that information from one doctor to the other. So yeah. anybody out there who's having trouble with swallowing is thinking about baclofen, you know, you just learned something today, you know, that uh, maybe that's not the best choice. The other thing about baclofen is it makes about 40% of people sleepy. Uh, one yeah. It numbs your whole body. And yeah. it numbs your whole body, basically. Yeah. It's yeah. like a tranquilizer. Yeah. Well, yeah, one thing you can do to, 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 I know of several people, Neil Isaac for one, who uh, they take their baclofen right before bed because then it has a 24 hour effect without like knocking them out. You know, if you take mm -hmm. it at lunch, you're going to be taking a nap at three o'clock. Um, yeah. 
not everybody, but some some no. people. So there are a lot of side effects. You were yeah, talking- and there's side effects to the other thing. Like you develop what's called baclofen tolerance as well. So <clears throat> your your body gets less responsive to the drug. So you need more of it. So so the likelihood is that you develop more side effects. Um, the same can be said for benzodiazepines, uh, you know, uh, diazepam is a muscle relaxant, but it's it's also used as an anti-anxiety psychiatric medication. So uh, taking too much diazepam, first of all, is incredibly addictive. Yeah, I was going to say um, it's also addictive. Yeah, it's incredibly addictive. Uh, secondly, you, you develop dependence, dosage dependence. You, you, you end up needing more and more and more. Um, almost the same as opioids, I guess. So people who take oromorph morphine for pain or i don't know what you, to, you call it something different i'm sure you do over there um i don't know but you, you end up developing that and then the side effects are you can end up not breathing because it affects your you know breathing side of things so what i mean yeah, is yeah. That the drugs are not just a sit and i think they've looked at too simplistically as a solution for tone um you know here's your high tone have some of this it'll <laughs> relax your muscles and there's often not enough of a consideration of the the wider implications of taking that medication long term and how like what your your friend just said how it can affect your quality of life in other ways by making you so sleepy that you can't go out the house um you know that affects your social interaction and things like that so 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 there's lots of wider reaching effects of lots of these so when, when we're thinking about any form of medical management botox included it's important to look at it from a whole person's perspective not just i have spasticity here here's some botox that should help it's it's how does that interact with my physio my, my pt it's how does that what side effects could that cause me will that limit my ability to then recover function in that limb um and, and those and you know i would have to then you know be routinely going back for this for the long term getting these injections constantly uh, how does that how, what are the implications for me for that and also financially you know in your system financial implications so there's lots of different things to consider before starting any of these things. I have a question. Sure. Um, I go to my PT and she recommends that I do um, Botox. I brought it up with my doctor and she said, you're not required or need Botox because you are so flexible. So she you knows she's looking at everything. So I'm torn between the two. What should I do now? If you if you can passively stretch out your affected arm and you can do that with very little effort and position it as such, I would agree with your doctor. Mm-hmm. That I would okay. say that it's best not to require the Botox because what would be the reason that the PT wants the Botox for? She said because um, my arm cannot um, stretch out yet, but I'm doing all the exercises that required because I'm following what Ralph has told me to do. So I'm, I think mm. I can stretch it up more now than I did when I first saw her. Yeah. So that's the thing is, is that it's important for your PT to also figure out whether you can't stretch your arm out because of spasticity, which is an active contraction of the muscle, or because you can't move your arm as well. Have you got an underlying soft tissue shortening and a, a reduced length of that muscle that's preventing it stretching further? Because this is the thing of how spasticity interacts. Spasticity is an active process. The muscle physically contracts to cause your arm to shorten. But if you hold your limb, and if I hold my limb without spasticity and Ralph without his spasticity, if he just holds his limb in a cast for for six weeks and then tries to straighten it, he can't straighten it either. I can't straighten it either. That's not spasticity. It's my muscles have shortened. So it's important to know that have your muscles shortened because you've got mild spasticity and then haven't moved very much or can't move very much. So is determining is the length is the lengthening is the issue with lengthening purely spasticity or is it also an underlying soft tissue shortening um, before you make that decision i would think if you can if you can get how far off straightening can you not get your arm just out of curiosity um i can raise my elbow and so i'm using my pvc pipe to stretch it out more you know? Yeah, so I could see you. So you can, yeah. So I would say your arm isn't hooked across your body. I mean, you, you're looking like you're only losing about 20 degrees of extension, um, and that to me didn't look like a spasticity limitation. That looked like it was tight. Um, so I would say persevere with more stretching um, and see how that goes. 
Okay, Particularly since, is it, causing, is it causing you pain? I don't have any pain at all. I wouldn't inject it then. I, yeah. I would just maintain it conservatively and treat it with, with stretching and other adjuncts. Yep, thank you. Good advice. Um, I have a question too. Great. Oh. Uh, I had a stroke almost six years ago. And I do have a little spasticity in my arm muscles and in my leg, my lower leg and kind of across the top of my foot. I haven't had any problems with it until recently. Uh, I've become less active because I need knee surgery and I'm waiting on that. And all of a sudden now this uh, muscle in my foot has started cramping and it's cramping to the point it's pulling muscles in my upper leg. Is that a result of spasticity and less use of my legs because of my bad knees? What time yeah. is it? I'm sorry. I mean, sometimes if you're on um, um, like um, a type of medicine will cause that too, uh, cramps. Uh, you know. Yeah, so um, spasticity, whilst its initiation is from the stroke, Anything that feeds into a heightened sense of muscle tone naturally will, will exaggerate spasticity. So I'm guessing you're needing knee surgery because of knee pain, right? Yes. Yeah, so pain will feed into higher muscle tone. So the more pain you're experiencing, the higher your spasticity will go. A lot of people will report when they're in pain, when they're incredibly stressed or sleep deprived, uh, their spasticity is much worse. Um, when they're ill as well, so if they have the flu, um, then their spasticity is often a lot worse as well. So when you're awaiting knee surgery, if you have pain, pain naturally heightens muscle tension as a fight or flight type response. So spasticity will likewise increase. Um, I would say that in that instance, to break the cycle, the best thing to do is to try and as best as possible is to manage the pain in your knees to try and minimize the effect of the spasticity. Uh Good also with more, act uh, with more yeah, activity <laughs> with more activity any... help it. That's what I'm wondering. Because are, yeah, are you on any kind of statins? Are you on any statins? No. Okay. No, no. I don't take statins. Okay. No. Well, I, I think that the more that you weight bear on your limbs will, will assist in, in maintaining muscle function and that will reduce the, the involuntary movement of spasticity that's there. Okay. But right. I think that's what I'm wondering about. Yeah, a good thing to bear in mind though is, is if you can manage the knee pain better, your spasticity and your spasms will be less. Okay. If your knees can handle it, you can do some weight bearing at the counter. Uh, Tom, I'm interested in your opinion. I was thinking they could possibly even seed it do some um, um, <coughs> dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, heel raises, whatever. To, to, because isn't yeah. uh, I think if you're if you're getting spasms in your calf, um, a, a good exercise for you would be to use something like a to be in a low tone position. So, for example, lying on the bed, sat up, um, using like a rolled up towel around your foot to gently pull it into a stretch. As long as it doesn't put too much load on your knee. I, are you needing the knee surgery for like a, an arthritis? Is that what I'm assuming? <laughs> yeah. Mm. But see, I've, I've needed this knee surgery for two years, but I've had other physical problems that were more important to take care of. So I've yeah. been a lot less physically active in the last two years than I normally am. And that's when the spasticity started acting up. Yeah. So what I would say is that weight bearing exercises, because they probably aggravate your, your, your arthritis, right? So to do a squat in particular might be a bit painful. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. So, so what I would say is, is, is sit, sit, lie on a bed, put a rolled up pillow underneath your knee to support it, and then get a towel, pull, put it round the, the forefoot and gently pull it back as long as it doesn't put too much stress yeah. on your knee. That should maintain the length of your calf that's most likely spastic without putting too much stress on the knee joint because you're keeping it in a nice open, low load posture. So okay. that would work quite that's effectively what, for you. My my physical therapist had me doing that very thing today. So thank yeah. you. 
So um, what I would say is is that do expect when you do have knee surgery for your spasticity to to probably increase quite a lot initially. So just just bear that in mind. Yeah? Because of the pain, the pain and the trauma to the, your system of having surgery can often make spasticity post stroke elevate. Okay. It's the same for all forms of high tone. So it's it's the same as if I don't know if any of you fell after a stroke, um, but when you fall, you often find that your tone goes incredibly high for a good day or two. Um, it's the same sort of thing when you have surgery. But don't worry about it. It should get better when you start to mobilize. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. It sounds like, you know, get moving and keep moving is always a good strategy. Yeah, keep moving as long as it doesn't cause pain that right. exaggerates the spasticity. Yeah. That's always a caveat. Same with like raising, you know, using a dowel or a PVC pipe to raise your, your shoulder. I, I did. My shoulder came back uh, last. Actually, my uh, hand came back first and went the other way. That's why I yeah, which is, that, that happens, but it's the more unusual form. Usually it's it's top down. Right. Usually it's yeah, big gross muscles to finer muscles. But you know, I've yeah. seen I've seen people who say, you know, my hand's working, but my shoulder's supposed to work first, so I'm gonna wait. I actually had somebody say, I'm gonna wait and do my hand till my shoulder comes back. And I said, No, work on your mm. shoulder, but you know, work what works. If your hand is working you use the word flickers, which is interesting because um, some people use the term flickers of movement. So, you know, if, if you can if you can get something going, you can generally um, build on it. So, um, yeah. to, to me, um, getting some motion, whether you have to do it passively uh, at first is still a good thing because until you can move it passively, I don't see a lot of people just picking up their arm and, you know, sticking it over their head. Oh yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, I mean, stroke recovery, passive movements important immediately post stroke because a, it maintains the, the, the length tension relationship in your muscles and joints prevents them seizing up. Um, it's also important for what's called proprioceptive feedback. So sensation around the joints of how they still move for the brain to understand that. Um, but, but they, they quite often in an early stage, and this is something that we would talk about on the other talk, I think we were having was the, um, the fact that um, passive range is important, but it doesn't necessarily cause the limb to recover again. You sometimes have to use the involuntary movement first, to initiate a contraction for your brain to experience the contraction for it to know how to then take control of it. So sometimes we start with reflexes and reactions and passive movement is just part of it. But if your therapist is committing solely to passive movement with the expectation that your limb will then start working again, then it's most likely you'll be disappointed because it doesn't normally happen like that. Unless you've had a mild stroke and the stroke almost like a transient attack, a very small stroke, and it, the brain has enough capacity to spontaneously recover, which it does do in, in milder strokes. Right. And t Tom has agreed to come back and uh, another date um, that we haven't um, nailed down yet, but we will, and <clears throat> talk about the other approach to this, which is the neurological approach. And I'll tell you, about 10 minutes into this, I wondered if we were going to be able to talk about Botox and spasticity without um, getting into uh, the second talk, but we definitely um, managed uh, to do that. We danced our way around the whole yeah. neurological approach and the BOPATH method and, and, and everything. So that's good because... Um, Tom's a big believer in uh, the neurological approach, as am I. Um, <clears throat> I think there are orthopedic things and physical things and natural things that you can do, but I, I think it's important that you understand and work with the way your brain works. It seems logical to me. If you want to get better, the more you understand the way your brain works and the more focused approach you can take, the more likely it is that you know you're going to see positive results so um ralph did someone put their hand up before by the way oh i don't know michelle michelle 
Um, I just had a comment. My last round of Botox, I actually lost function that I was able to do. I I pick up pegs and move blocks at my house. And when I got Botox, I was unable to pick up the pegs anymore. <laughs> yep. And that, that's because the Botox will have paralyzed your muscle. So you, you wouldn't have been able to use it. So it's, 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 that's the problem is that you probably, am I right in saying you develop the ability to grip, but not release? I've got, I have both. Um, and, but I was just unable to get my thumb to even come together with my index after the Botox. So yeah. I'm like six weeks out now and I'm able to do it again, but, but yeah, I cause it will start wearing off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the thing is, if you've got if you've got, if you've got some movement, it's a very difficult balancing act because if you've got spasticity to the point where you can't where you can grip but can't can't release and, and it digs into your hand and you really can't play it out, Botox is you know it can be useful. But if what you're saying you had some form of dexterity before the Botox, then you can see actually the evidence of the discussion that we're having, which is that it might help your hand to be more relaxed, but then you can't use it as well. Yeah. Two things I think are going on here. I think that a lot of stroke survivors see Botox as what we call a magic bullet, um, uh, you know, yeah. uh, fix. And, <clears throat> and it's not. And the other thing I think is going on here with, uh, with all due respect to your profession, because I know lots of really good PTs and OTs, but Sometimes when people run out of ideas, they just they go back to the book or, you know, and, and uh, look up what they should do or pull out the Botox or, or, or whatever. I think that, um, well, you know, the problem we've got here is that most of the therapists know they're only going to see you uh, 10, 20, 20, maybe 24 times. And then insurance is going to send you out the revolving door. Maybe you can come back next year. But. We don't have enough coverage to uh, for a lot of us to work long term on mm -hmm. on things. So, you know, they know that you're going to be out of um, insurance, and here I'm defending them because um, somebody who takes that approach could say, "Well, you know, I'm not going to this. This person's only got a few more visits. You know, maybe this will work for them. Pretty soon they're going to be out the door, and you have no idea whether they'll mm -hmm. ever, you know, be back." So, so what's the what's the system then, Ralph? So when you have a stroke in the States, what's the pathway? Like what happens from point of stroke to going home? What does that look like? OK, well, I, I know a little bit about it. <clears throat> um, they take about everybody who had a, a stroke to the hospital and they do some level of acute care. Yep. Uh, literally only about a third of people go to rehab hospitals in the States. About two thirds of the people actually are sent home after five days in, in, yeah, I see. You make is, that even, is that even severe strokes? So ones that are needing a hoist to move around and. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. I, you no. know, if they treat a Hoyer lip person, um, differently, but, um, so typically, uh, over half of the uh, people who have a stroke uh, only get the acute care. Sometimes they'll, they'll then send them to outpatient, but only about a third of people go to a rehab hospital. I was lucky enough to, so I spent five days in neurology in the hospital, and then I spent almost three weeks in a rehab hospital, and then they kick you out as soon as you can uh, Toilet yourself, eat, and transfer. You're gone. Um, even if they're, you know, I mean, even if you're, you know, eating yeah. like that, and <laughs> Billy's laughing because we all yeah. ate like that at one point. You know, your transfers uh, aren't pretty, but you can do them without somebody. Then they have a a number, a, a metric, and once you re reset metric, you go home. And then what's the care like at home? Is that insurance dependent or is that like a blanket level of care for everyone that? No, it's insurance dependent. Everybody here has different kinds of insurance. And, you know, some people will say, 
Well, you know, I got uh, 40 visits a year and I got Botox and I got this and I got that because I have really good insurance. And, I, and then you see other people say, my insurance only paid for 12 visits of PT. Well, that's not, that's not very many. We all know that. So it, it, care really uh, varies, but... Um, I suppose, I suppose we're, we're in a, we're not obviously, we don't have the insurance model. We do have private health insurance that you can purchase optionally, but everyone pays into what's called national insurance. Right. So um, we have the social system, which is the NHS. So effectively we're, we're, our method is you're admitted to the acute hospital. Um, and then unless you have had a mild stroke, so you can self care um, to the point where you're almost normal Um we would arrange therapy for you to then leave, but you would likely go to a rehabilitation hospital um, of which you'd stay between four to six weeks. Um, and you'd receive oh. kind of daily physio apart from weekends. Um, but then when you go home, that's where it stops. So when, when you go home, you get the time frame, but it's not goal dependent. So even if you're still unable to stand up after six weeks, you have to go home. Um, or if you're walking, you can, you can go. Is it anything in between? And we make sure the care's there and things to, to support you. But in terms of physio at home, that is where the system falls apart because a very select small group of people who are already performing over a certain physical ability can get therapy for six weeks, twice a week. So that would be, what's that then? Six weeks, twice a week. Um, so that would be 12 sessions. <laughs> That's the best we've got in the community. Um, and then the other version is you'd have to wait about five months before you can even start PT. And then you would get it once a week over six sessions. So you'd only get six sessions. Hmm. So the, the inpatient system's pretty good when you're in hospital, but there's this big drop off, which is when you then leave hospital, if you're not achieving all your goals that you want to, you are very much left with very, very little PT at all which is where it's kind of the haves and the have nots happen, where if you can afford private care, you can pay for private care. And if you can't, tough luck, you, you, you don't have the ability. <laughs> You're done. Yeah, ours is kind of, we do the acute care, rehab hospitals are like a luxury. And then we get more, we get outpatient. Some people, if you can't, if you're not ambulatory at all, and you can't get to outpatient PT, they will send in uh, at-home therapy. Um, I've never seen any at-home therapy. Well, I guess I saw mm. somebody I worked with who had at-home therapy who got better enough to be able to go to outpatient. But we get more outpatient than 12. 12 is like a minimum. I got 30. I also found somebody That's gave good. me a tip. And that was uh, that my insurance company would consider one visit if I did PT and OT on the same day. So I did two evals and then I did t uh, 29 sessions where I did both. So I got 50, I got, you know, a lot, yeah, that's good. I got a, a lot more, but you have to know yeah. if somebody hadn't given me that tip, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't no. have gotten that. Uh, and so, is there an option to self-fund? Like, is that a thing over there? So if you don't have insurance, can you self-pay for therapy? Oh, you can. Yeah, you can. And guess what? Yeah. I self-paid I self for somebody I work with. And uh, I didn't let her know it because she wouldn't have wa wanted it to happen. But uh, and, you know, what? they charged me $100 for a session. You know what they charge me at this very same place? What they build by insurance company? Three hundred and thirty dollars. Wow! 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 Yeah. So actually, you can, but see the the problem we've got is our disability sucks in the U.S. I was just listening to a report on an NPR on aging. It was on poverty, but it was on older folks and our retirement and disabilities don't really take care of you. Um, so you can't be, you know, that person got more than anybody I've known. I don't want to know people's finances, but sometimes I, ha I pay their bills and lick the stamps and send them out for them and that kind of thing, or I did. Um, 
you know, she got around two thousand uh, dollars, but I also know somebody who gets on about seven hundred dollars. Well, how many? You can't pay for a lot of therapy, even if it's one third what the insurance no. company, uh, you know, no. has to pay. If you're yeah. living on a thousand dollars, you know, because if you went once a week, that's four hundred dollars. That's forty yeah. percent of your budget right there. Yeah, and I suppose this is a similar model here. Like, I'm surprised that actually the the hundred dollars per session in the states is actually less than what i thought you would say um because i would have assumed that pay as you go private health care was a lot more expensive um i can only speak for this one experience at the one yeah. local hospital they also gave yeah. me 15 percent uh break if i paid uh right away so i pulled out yeah. cash every time while she was yeah, that's that's i mean I'd i mean like for example our, our business will charge about 80 dollars for, for a session if we worked it on the exchange it's about 80 but um it's just interesting to see how your models work so of affect how your accessibility to therapy to manage spasticity longer term right. works um yeah, yeah. Excuse me, but Ralph, the, the bottom line i think is the bottom line i think is uh, of the whole thing is if you don't do exercises you don't work at it you might as well forget about it your botox all this other stuff just keep working, stretching your arm, doing your exercises. That's that's the magic pill. That, that's the yeah. bottom line. It's the harder yeah. one, though. It's the harder pill to swallow, but it's yeah. it's the it's the truth. I'm afraid. I think that yeah. you know, Botox is useful for the reasons that we've said. It's useful right. for intense pain. It's useful for when an arm is at the extremes of spasticity that you can't even stretch it because it just does not move, uh, then it's useful. If you can start stretching a limb um, and it's not painful and it's manageable with very low level pain relief, then I would just always advocate you continue with your PT, you continue with your, your exercise therapy. But the bottom line is you know, Botox does work. It helps you to stretch your arm out a little so you can do the therapy to move the arm. So it's, it's like a two two action thing. But the bottom line is if you don't move your arm, the Botox is not going to do you any good. It's no, no, thing. no. And the, the Botox is useful to helping you to stretch an arm. That's the thing. Right. It's just not helpful to get it's it like to a, move like, again. Like a break, break release. Yeah, it's a break release. So it helps your arm to stretch more. It helps yeah. it to, to come away. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will then be able to move no. the arm. But I think I think a lot of a lot of the people think it's going to help them. It's going to cure me. Oh, is it going to yeah. help me? And I'm going to be all set now. But that's yeah. not what happens. No, and I bet they're very disappointed by it as yeah. well. Um, and one thing that never gets discussed in the whole brain uh, uh, stem cell uh, uh, discussion is. Um, if they put them, if they figure out how to how to deliver them, and they're still working on that, you can't you can't eat them. Uh, they don't work very well when you uh, inject them into the bloodstream. Uh, most of the success in Stanford and Mayo Clinic is coming from applying them directly. I we talked to Dr. Mark Dark Mark McDonald recently, and he said that you know one of the problems they're having is that stem cells don't necessarily convert to neurons. Yeah, because this is the, this is the thing. If the delivery system was perfect and they all converted to neurons, guess what? They aren't trained to be Billy Forte or Ralph Preston before their stroke. You're still going to have to. Yeah. You'll it's, have to teach the suckers. Even yeah, if it's not like it's not like a flat tire that you can just replace. I think the bottom yeah. line is you have to do your stretches. You have to do your movement. Otherwise, you might as well forget about it. Plain and simple. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Yeah. If you can. You only for a philosopher. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have, to, you have to know the truth. I mean, you know, the Botox is great to release the arm, but in releasing the arm, you have to put the work into it. You can't just go to sleep and say, oh, it's fixed now. Oh, good. It doesn't happen that way. Well. You know? And what I learned today was that it's another thing you need to learn about in addition to, you know, becoming your own PT, becoming a, your own best patient advocate. Right. Because remember, oh. um, your SLP isn't necessarily going to talk to the neurologist who might inject you with Botox and make your swallowing worse. So it comes back to us yet again in terms of yeah. 
um, increasing our knowledge base so that we can go into, I mentioned this before, like the seven questions to ask your neurologist. And you gave us, Tom, a bunch of good things, you know, to discuss with with our therapists and to know about. Because if you don't know about how these things work, then you, you can't go into yeah. to your uh, therapist and ask them, uh, you know, for a spasticity test or say, or say things like, well, I've got swallowing issues and you're recommending Botox. I've heard that's not... Well, the, the Botox is yeah. fine for swallowing. It's Baclofen. So Botox would be fine for that's right. swallowing yeah. issues, but anything that's, that's oral... Then that, the, that, the Baclofen, I think, goes through your whole body. Yeah, but the Botox but won't. The Botox so you can have Botox, it won't affect your swallow, but Baclofen, yeah. Yeah. I totally screwed that up. But still, the, the point's valid that... You know, you know, again, with all these things, in terms of managing spasticity, um, it kind of falls to us to, you know, get some kind of evaluation, learn about it, try and figure out w w and work with our uh, providers to get the best outcome for us because it's not it's not a magic bullet and, and they're uh, why there wouldn't be doing testing on spasticity if there wasn't a wide range of results from that and treating the one type is uh would be assumed is different than the other yeah so tom's given us a lot of time yeah. anybody, and it's also like you know 9 30 at <laughs> night for him so anybody <laughs> got any more questions so uh, otherwise i'm feeling like we should um uh, stop wait i think another go. one no. That's when fine. It's so okay. Left. You ask away. It's fine. <laughs> it's really ref reference to baclofen. Um, I was taking one pill, 10 milligram each day. And my doctor, as well as my PT, suggest that I take two each day, half lunchtime, half dinner, and then one whole one at night when I sleep. You think I should do that? I think that it's difficult for me to recommend specific medical adjustments to your prescription because it's not within my professional scope to do that. Um, if that's what the doctor recommends, I would I would trust the doctor in that sense. Uh, it, 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 people can split baclofen. And the reason might be that having more at night is because the drowsiness side effects won't affect you so much because you're falling asleep. And you're likely to have a better night's sleep if your spasticity interferes with your ability to sleep. So if that's the reason, then that sounds like it's it's a reasoned argument. So, yeah. yeah. I know with the back you've been, you just can't stop it. You have to be, you have to do it gradually. You just can't say, oh, today I'm not going to do it anymore. And that's it. It doesn't work that way, back you've been. Oh, no. It'll no, close. you have to titrate off it as well as onto it. Right. Right. Um, and I, I can attest, I saw the results of um, my friend who had the spinal cord injury. He ended up, they, he went on a whole baclofen journey, but he also would decide he didn't like it and stopped taking it. And we couldn't figure out, we were working with him twice a week, teaching him how to walk again. And some, you know, he'd be doing great and all of a sudden he wouldn't be and it would finally find out, you know, he wasn't taking his pills and... He said, we thought your wife was, well, he was having trouble with all this because uh, he had a brain injury and he was like resistant yeah. to a lot of things. And it turned out he said, oh, no, I just take him and do that. He was palming him. Yeah. yeah. He was him out later. And he went, he went nuts. He went crazy. He tried to hang, he, he got a rope and tied a noose. He never tried to hang himself, but he did get on his tricycle and try and ride off the dock into the, river and uh yeah it'll, 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 yeah it'll, you just can't it'll, stop it he ended up with a pump and then he said nope and they took the pump out and now he's off of it completely about four years later hmm. so it's it's a crazy thing and uh you know he went to uh, half a dozen neurologists, and some would say you need more baclofen, and the next one would say you need less baclofen. You're taking too much. So it's back to us. You know, we, we need to listen to the doctors because we're not doctors. But 
the doctors don't live in our bodies either. So paying attention to your body and, and what's going on with you and then having, uh, bringing that to your doctors and your therapists is, you know, to, to me, the answer is back to being your own PT and your own patient. Yeah. I think it's just asking more questions, isn't it? Um, it's, you know, something suggested to you, I want to, maybe you should try Botox. And I think your responsibility is to go, well, what's the reason for that? And what, you know, how would that benefit me? And are there any other options? Is it that stretching isn't working? Or is there anything you can do as a PT that can maybe treat me without trying Botox first? I think it's just, it's just trying to see what else is there. Um, and making sure that it's, your PT understands the re their, their own clinical reasoning behind requesting something like Botox. Because if you go, why, why Botox and why not anything else? And they go, well, I'm not, I don't really know of anything else. Then what's to say that you trust them to decide on Botox? <laughs> He's a horse doctor. He's a horse doctor. He's a horse. Sometimes they run out of ideas. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all theory, basically. And it's how much theory they get taught in school. It's really the people that have the strokes, that do the everyday functions. They know what's happening. They know how to treat their body if they, if they want to treat their body. That's the, that, that's the bottom line. Um, I mean, doctors are, are more, they know what's going on. They're intelligent. They've been to school for many years. So they know the different things that interact. But the, the thing that I see is, that the actual person is the best, is his best own doctor. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, I agree. I think it's, yeah. And I think it's a case as well as, um, it's understanding with, with the spasticity and its interaction with pain. It, you, you can, they, they are together, they interact, but you, you try to understand which feeds into the cycle as well. Because for example, if you've got high spasticity, and what's feeding into that is neuropathic pain. It might be better that you're treating medically the neuropathic pain and not treating the spasticity. So treat the pain and see how the spasticity responds before you treat the spasticity. So a good example would be someone that's that's that's, that's got uh, often the neuropathic pain presentation in 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 strokes is that of like a, usually deep thumb pain and a shoulder pain. Um, in the absence of a, a, a sublux shoulder, um, typically exaggerated when you get to about that position, um, really, really painful. But if you've got spasticity as well as that pain, it might be that, that you're treated with something like amitriptyline or gabapentin or pregabalin to treat the pain from a medical point of view first. And then the spasticity might drop because the pain's dropped. Meanwhile, you could have the, the baclofen, but still have the pain. You, you see, it's, <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's, it's judging which is feeding it's into all, it's which. It's all theory. It's all uh, yeah. hit and miss, basically. Well, but, you know, what, what we're all saying is well, but, yeah. that the more you educate yourself and the more you interact with those professionals on, you know, a more educated level, then the more likely you are to hit on something that works for you. Yeah, yeah. that's it. As opposed to the, you know, magic bullet Right. so there's no magic bullet well yeah there is hard work <laughs> exactly <laughs> like anything in life i i wrote this whole thing about you know my my magic bullet or uh cure and it, it said um line one is uh start a home therapy program for all your affected uh limbs and muscles and do it every day Look up on the internet for magic cure number one. Talk to your um, insurance company about it and find out they don't. Oh, every other line says continue with the home program. Then talk to uh, find out your insurance company doesn't pay for said magic bullet. Continue your home program. Talk to a friend about starting a GoFundMe. Then decide you don't want the embarrassment of that. Continue your home <laughs> therapy program. Yeah. And, so, number two, continue your home therapy program. So, you know, every other line is do the work because there's really no yeah. way around it. I, I wish we could instill that in some of the people that um, don't seem to get that. But, you yeah. know, 
you know, if there was a magic bullet for strokes, it'd be a wonderful thing for patients and it'd be a terrible thing for me. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, since it's a condition, not a disease, I don't think yeah. I, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Plus, you know, I've read some of your reviews. You get, you know, you're you're kicking butt over there. You got a lot of happy patients, so I don't think. Uh, I think what it is is you care about what's happening, basically. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of times you get PTs that, like like Rob was saying, oh yeah, you have six visits. Come in, knock them out. Goodbye. Have a good day. But you seem like you care what's happening to the patients and what, what they're, what, what's going on with them, and you and you want them to get better. Of course, a lot it of these is. I treat PTs out there. They're just doing their theory. They're doing their, their eight hour days and they're going home, and that's it. No, I do. Um, I work a lot more than eight hour days. No, that's not right. that's right. that much. That's oh, yeah. You, you see, yeah, well, you, I, see that you care. Yeah. I mean, without with our business, I teach everyone that works for me it is the same philosophy as you treat all of our patients as if they're, they're your own family. That's that's what that, we do. That, that's a great That's a great thing. Um, that and, you know, I, my phone, I tell every one of my patients, my phone is always on. I have some patients ring me at one in the morning, three in the morning, and I will wake up. I will answer that phone because yeah. strokes are such, you're, they happen in a moment and they affect your life. So you're, you're, you're a rare person. Believe me, let me tell you. You're, 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 well, plus, if you do that, you'll never have to spend a penny on advertising. Well, I, I do, but not too much. But yeah, I, I don't need to now. But yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. I ran businesses. I didn't have, <laughs> built them up from nothing like you did. I didn't have budget for advertising. So what's the one thing you can do? Even take care even, of everybody. And they tell yeah, my 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 admin assistant is even every week. Um, she rings all the relatives of the patients as well. And this is another thing we do. So um, because. I, but I always say I look after the patients and she looks after the relatives because often in that acute phase, it's hard for family to process it too. And so she always gives like counseling and stuff each week and things. So we, we try and look at it that way. So it's, it's, it's a whole person approach, a whole family approach to straight rehab as well. There's a great line from the movie aphasia. It's called, uh, says what happens to one happens to two. Yeah, because yeah. caregivers have a tough job, and they get no they get no training at all. My, no, my, because you know if you're if you're in if you've got lots of spasticity, you know, keeping on the topic, and you're in pain, and you know a patient could be up at three in the morning and crying, and you're that caregiver, you know, and you feel like you can't do anything, so that they also suffer to a degree as well. So it's just you know it's it's understanding that, and I think you know the problem with uh, worldwide healthcare is it's far too linear. It looks far too much at, at the medical model of problem treatment rather than problem and how that impacts you biologically, psychologically, and socially. It's looking at that whole model. The human model. Yeah. And that's not, we're still, you know, it's 2022 and there's still not that good. At, we're still not that good at that, but you know, <laughs> Yeah, well, well we're doing a lot of things. I'm 70 years old. I thought I was going to see big change in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going the, backwards. For the, for the better. And, yeah. you know, some things get better, but. You have an iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I meant things. Yeah, I got an iPhone, but I haven't seen us evolve as much as I thought we might as a species, you know. We're still doing mm. a lot of stupid things and, you know. I mean, just go to the gas pump. But anyway, it's in a political discussion. Yeah. Um, or in England, just go to the grocery store. No, yeah. it's no better here. It's no better. What happens to just always remember whatever happens in the States happens to us. Oh, yeah. We well, you guys just yeah. You have maybe have worse uh, food issues than we do right now. Uh, I just was reading something saying uh, grocery prices were up 11%. Hey, you like you growing your own mushrooms. <laughs> it's not too i mean the food prices it's not the food prices that are too bad it's the cost of um heating your home gas and electric ah. uh, that's that's what's that's what's crippling people and because of mortgage raise rises at the minute people are paying now about six hundred dollars more a month than what they were paying two months ago on their mortgage yeah. uh, so it's yeah 
that's what we're, that's what we're having. We're trying to close <laughs> everything down, basically. Go yeah. Ukrainians. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm yeah, rooting I, for the Ukrainians, but if that's there's any more stress, you know, guys. I'll be joining you guys because I'd have ended up having a stroke with all the stress, you know, <laughs> with all of this modern living. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll be able to put your theory to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> be my own guinea pig. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, you know, I've uh, <clears throat> I've had two um uh PTs that had strokes uh, on the show. Wow. He had a stroke at six and became a PT, and he actually demonstrated um, a velocity based spasticity with his arm because if he moves it fast, you can actually see. He did it on camera. You can see it lock up. And I've actually seen people post videos where they're playing into their spasticity by moving too fast. Yeah. Um, hmm. All that passive motion isn't real fast, is it? You, know, you just try no. and. Just try. That can be fast enough. That can be fast enough for spasticity. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. But um, that's really valuable to meet people like that that have had strokes and then become clinicians in the field as well. That's that's well, something I can never at the pr present time never never have. So. Well, Mitch had his stroke at six years old, so it kind of you know he it defined him in a sense from very fairly early age, and then David Dancero ha was. Uh, a PT, he was a sports nutritionist, and then he became a physical therapist. And then he mm -hmm. had a stroke, and he returned to his physical therapy practice. And if that wasn't good enough, he ran two Boston marathons after his stroke. Wow. That's yeah, impressive. That's really yeah. Well, he gave some really good advice on on running, and that is work on your ankle. It's all about the ankle and the push off. Yeah. You, if you can't push off. You can't do a good heel toe and push off with that affected toe. You aren't going to run. Yeah. Uh, so you agree with that? Good. I, yeah, I'll... oh no, no, hundred percent. I think uh, the problem, the difficulty you have with your spasticity is that is that it affects your calf. So it, it keeps your foot. A lot of you will end up walking with high spasticity on your toe first. It's like toe heel, toe heel, rather than than, than heel toe. Or you'll have that. Um, that, that, that really uncomfortable feeling when your foot rotates inwards and it turns in and you almost feel like you're going to roll your ankle all the time. So, um, like I say, you, you've got options, which is the, the exercise therapy, um, the stretch therapy. You have got the AFOs, the dreaded AFOs. <laughs> um, or more dynamic versions of them that, that don't provide such rigid support. Yeah, I'm in, in favor of them unless you have really bad ankle roll or supination. Um, yeah. um, we have ones that go into like um, they kind of like little hooks that go into your shoes that you can sort of pull pull up and do you like wear an ankle wrap around thing that you kind of attach it to. Right. That way, at least yeah. at least you can dorsiflect. Uh, they'll keep. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's just it's just not a hard plastic support that goes behind your leg. Yeah, well, they gave me a hard plastic thing just to keep my toe up. And I said, how am I going to learn to keep my toe up with this stamp? Yeah. So uh, I got home on day one. I threw it in the back of the closet and never wore it again. I had a little bit of ankle roll, but I said, okay, I'm going to pay attention to that. And I didn't know about ankle, but I said, okay, this is my foot and my ankle. So I started yeah. you know, just trying to build it up and pay real yeah. strict attention to it when I walked to yeah. not let it roll. And, yeah. you know, a few months later, uh, my ankle wasn't really rolling at all. No, and I think um, if you were to think of the Botox line here as well, if you had that high tone and you'd think, oh, I'll yeah, Botox that, the, the problem is is that a lot of that tone would probably keep you upright. So you end up Botox in a calf, um, and what can often happen is then people can't support their own weight on that leg. So you can they can walk with the high tone, and then you take it all away with the Botox, and then they, they struggle to then walk. So... I'm having a light bulb moment here because we got a lot of people saying they're like six months out and they're going backwards. So I'm wondering I'm, now I'm going to keep, now I'm going to keep, I have a, like a uh, hundred questions in the back of my mind. And when I ask you about, you know, the uh, agreeing with David Dancer, I mean, he's a PT he ran a marathon, so I believe him. But when, when you said 100%, you know, see, I pass out information and I like to have, two or three sources, uh, you know, from credible, yeah. 
credible sources before I go saying something. If I think something's dicey or iffy or I don't get it and one person said it to me, I don't repeat it until I've, until I've heard it from more than one. Because, you know, I didn't go to school. I'm not a clinician. So, and, I, and I'm trying to help people. So I certainly don't want to give out, you know, bad information. All right. Well, anybody else got? Um, I have a question for Tom. Okay. Tom? So you were saying about instead of the AFO to get the uh, the strap for the ankle, do you think that would work? Yeah. So I we use a mixture of both of them depending on the situation. So if you've got um, a complete foot drop and it's not yeah, high toe, it just completely flops, but there's no spasticity or clonus, often the softer versions are much better because you can control the level of inversion and eversion with them as well. So the ones that involve Velcro around your laces that pull your shoe up, you've got to wear a shoe with them, but you can often pull them to then correct the alignment of your foot. Um, when you're higher tone, um, sometimes the firmer ones are better. But if you if you haven't already explored it, like what Ralph said, it would be to try and rehabilitate the ability to pull your toes up. Um, and then if you could do that through um, we'd have to use the different conversation about Brunstrom and Bobath, which is another day, but we would, you, you would do your exercise therapy. Um, and if that wasn't working, you could even try what's called functional electrical stimulation to see if that helps. I don't know if you guys do that over in the States. I don't know if that's a thing. Yeah. yeah I, you I call heard it that. But it's the same thing. So Sophia, the, I've seen people where, like you look down at their, at their foot instead of it being flat, it's like at 90 degrees. So yeah, okay. that that's what I have. Exactly. And have if I want to stand up without the AFO, it's so painful. And I feel like my ankle is going to break. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, you need a really support. You need a more supportive AFO. So yeah. Yeah. based on what you're telling me, the firmer version is probably better for you. Yeah. So I have the plastic one. So yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Some people, even with that level in this country, at least they have what's called a, a they have like a 3D printed one. So they will get their leg casted um, in a correct alignment and then they'll get like a printed AFO that, that wraps around the ankle more completely, almost like a caliper as such. But it, 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 it's not that really supports the foot in that position. Um, but that sounds like very high tone and very painful for you. So, yeah, sorry to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, but I don't think the um, the shoelace types. Uh, no, not for not for that. That's more for if you've got a floppy foot where yeah, it's not it's got any. Yeah, it's very hard to put on, and obviously I can tie it because of my other hand. But yeah, so probably the the firmer one for you would, would is going to be what works for you. Yeah. Otherwise, I can't even take two steps. Yeah, no, you wouldn't because it would be the pressure on your the outside of your ankle would be too great. Yeah. Well, one thing I basically my left foot is like this. Yeah. Sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so what's so the technical term for that is called spastic equina varus, what you're describing. So if you ever wanted to read into things about what treatments are available and, and if you remember that and you start looking around for different specific splints for that. They do do custom splints for spastic equina varus that, that might be better than what you've currently got. Spastic equino varus. So, oh gosh, how do I spell it? E Q U I N O V A R U S. Google will get it. So it's, Google will get it. It's like uh, the Latin word for horse. Horse, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But it, the, the, the term is spastic equina varus. That's, that's what that posture is that you're describing. I'll find, I'll find it and send it to you, Sophia. Awesome. Thank you, Ralph. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one thing I notice is that people who wear AFOs, because they're difficult to put on and off, particularly by yourself or impossible, yeah, they abandon them. Yeah. that they end up wearing them all the time. And mm. if you have somebody who, like your daughters who take it on and off for you, one of the things you could do would be talk to your physical therapist. Don't listen to me ever. But um, you could start other than the, I'm going to give you some general generalities. 
you know, one thing you can do is start trying to do um, ankle exercises. Try try and start doing, um, uh, if your PT agrees, uh, you could try some uh, counter weight bearing uh, and try and get that in the right position. Tom, you might be interested in this. I had somebody I was working with locally and his wife said, we want to get rid of, he wants to get rid of the AFO. And I said, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a PT. That's scary as heck. You know, yeah. I, but he didn't have bad ankle rolls. So, and, and he was the one person I, I worked with who did his homework all the time. So I showed him what neutral was as mm. far as that foot not rolling. I, I, I had him learn that. And then, uh, I told him to stand, uh, as long as he could in that mm. position at the counter and weight bear and do a little simple weight shifting. So shift weight to that leg even in the right position. And I went I, there. I, yeah, it's a good idea as long as the control's there. I, I think it depends if you start to do any form of weight shift, whether it instantly pulls into that inverted posture. Um, and whether is it even possible, even when you're lying down, does the foot relax or does it stay in that posture is it fixed in that equine of Aris? right he, he didn't have he didn't have very bad supination and i observed him i, I first saw him weight bear and then do some, some very minor weight shifting i observed yeah. him i came back and he said he did it two hours a day an hour in the morning an hour in the afternoon which yeah. is impressive and what i did was i took these big old monster hands of mine and I got down on my hands and knees and I grabbed that affected foot from the outside and I rolled it in a little bit. Yeah. I like I say, if it's malleable, if, if someone can, you know, adjust it with physical force, then stretching would be the best bet for it. Unfortunately, long term equina varus can become a fixed deformity. So if it's completely fixed, then the, the only solution at that point is surgical intervention where where sometimes an orthopedic surgeon will, will break the tarsus and will reset it and pin it into a normal alignment, mm -hmm. which some long-term chronic stroke patients find is their best solution. But I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that sometimes it, it's not a, it's not a cure, but it, it means that it might benefit your walking much better, but it, it's a case of, can you stretch it at this point or not? And I don't, I don't know you, personally so i wouldn't be able to tell you personally what's right right i understand but maybe if you can stretch it that's great or if someone else stretch it that would be great um do you have orthotists that, that sort out your your splints who who does your splints in the states is it is it the pt or is it the do you have someone called an orthotist yeah, yeah. Uh, orthotist orthotist yeah so maybe can you re refer to an orthotist and ask for a, a review um, and potentially a different type of splint that's more supportive within the shoes that you're using. Good or advice. maybe I, because I follow up with a doctor who um, specializes in uh, AFOs. Yeah. So maybe I can talk to uh, yeah. the doctor. Yeah. To explore that there's, there's different ranges of AFOs. Like I, the most yeah. common ones called a Swedish AFO, which is very much just a 90 degree right angle with a, calf strap that goes around the top mm -hmm. um but there are lots of different types there's carbon fiber ones that have a, a pitch on them so that you can you can um instead of being inverted it will have a it'll have a pronation pitch so it'll, as your foot hits the floor it will force it into a normal alignment uh, then you've got uh, caliper boots the where the, the the boot pulls the foot um and then you've got custom printed afos so you've got lots of different varieties so i'm thinking if you're on a standard afo with that level of high tone then could you stretch if not can you get a more bespoke orthotic to better suit your individual needs with with our model what happens is a lot of people get uh, because they pull out the afos like they do the botox and the baclofen uh, a lot of people um get an AFO and our insurance system doesn't last long enough for the PT to get, ever get you off the AFO. Oh, okay. If you need yeah. one, you know, it's going to take more than a couple of months to, to shed it. Yeah. Even this guy that I worked with, I mean, we, in about two months, he started doing sit, we did sit stands without the AFO and he's never worn it again. 
and and he, he conquered it. And Judy Johnson did the same thing. She came to me and said, ask about this. And I said, well, again, it's really dicey. I had her, I, I had her take, I had her caregiver take pictures with a camera on the floor of her ankles, uh, of, of her feet standing flat, flat on the floor because I was trying to determine whether or not I should even tell her how I did it. And the other thing was she listened. And yeah. she got off of it through the same method, which is, I mean, but some people, there's some people who just aren't going to be able to do that at, at no. that point in time. And the problem is, is that the more unstable you are when you're stood up, the higher your spasticity is as well. Because when there's a high balance demand to a task, a lot of you might notice that your arm then, or your arm becomes more tonic when you try and walk. Um or your leg gets a lot more active so the clonus exaggerates a lot more when you're weight bearing and that's likely because you're unstable around your sort of your axial your your trunk and your pelvis so the more unstable you are the more your limbs will become tonic much like if i was to walk on a tightrope my arms would would attempt to rebalance it's just with 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 you guys it usually manifests as the tone increasing much higher because it, those systems have lost that balance point it can only switch on or not so it switches on more Point being is that um, if you're wanting to try and develop more um, ankle control, often what we have to do in the early stages of rehab when it's a drop foot to get someone walking is we AFO people. So we have to almost AFO them earlier on until they're more balanced and more stable to when you can remove it and the tone is not overbearing. Then you can learn to move without it sort of thing. So they do serve their function, but I agree with you, Ralph, that it's, it's a, it's a shame for those that don't get that opportunity to wean off them. Uh, I, I've seen posts where people say, um, eight, ten years out, I'm still wearing my AFO. Now, there are people who are going to wear some type of brace, like, forever. But yeah. the amount of people in the groups, you, you guys all see it, you go in the groups, the amount yeah. of people that have had them six or eight years or whatever, just they got stuck with them. Is, is my conclusion because not all that many people could have that terrible of a, a, of a stroke. That's no, no. And the thing is, as well, is your brain's very good at accommodating something as well. So when you use an AFO, even if your spasticity is naturally dropped because you've recovered and you would have the, the neurological potential to regain the ability to toe lift, you might have habitually learned to walk with the AFO to such an extent that even without it, your brain, even I've seen patients that have full dorsiflexion when they're your know, full toe pull up, full ankle pull up when they're sitting down voluntarily, the moment they walk, they, they drop foot completely and there's no control over it because they've worn their AFO for too long and their brain has habituated to not using those muscles during gait. So that's what we call functional drop. So uh, the, the point being that, yeah, the earlier you can learn outside of height and spasticity to try to use the foot without an AFO, the better. Yep. Right. But they're, they're, they're dangerous. I mean, you have to be careful because you can actually break your ankle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Definitely. That's why, you know, the, yeah. Talk to, uh, Tom had the right idea. Uh, talk to the doctor that specializes in AFOs or, or your orthotist request yeah. review, you know, because see things change and, you know, I've also seen people say, I got my new AFO and other people come in and say, I've been wearing the same one for three years. Um, yeah. It yeah. seems to me yeah. if you're going to progress, I've seen people who've had like stiff toe ones and then they got one with a little bit of ankle flexion. Then they got one that didn't go up as high. I mean, yep. I don't, I didn't have, well, I had one, but I refused to wear, I just, I made a conscious decision that my role supination was not sufficient that I felt I needed to hold up my, my, my toe to keep my foot from rolling. So I chose yeah. not to do it, but I, Otherwise, it seems like it should be a, a progression, especially if it's bad. You go from a big bad one to a lesser one to a lesser one to. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Much like walking aids. And the thing is, is your 
you know, right. things change. Your brain changes with recovery, with time. You, the maturation of the, the, the stroke that you had will affect what output of motor control you've got. So it's very much the same as if you um, go to an optician, you know, because your, your vision's changed. And it's the equivalent of saying, well, I had these glasses last year and they worked for me then. So I'm just going to stick with them. I can't see out of them very well, but I'm not going to do anything about it. So it's kind of think of it the same thing. If your vision changed, you would go and get your eyes tested again. So yeah, if you're... it's crazy because I can see out of my right eye. I lost the vision. So it's crazy, too. Yeah. So like the one half of each side. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's maybe time to let Tom go. Thank and, you very uh, much, Tom. Oh. You're more than welcome. I learned quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> very, I learned this was quite pretty a bit. nice. Very helpful. Yes. Very helpful. Very. very. I'm sick of this AFO. <laughs> <laughs> I, tell you, I, need a, I need a new one now. I can walk yeah. without the AFO. I can walk without the AFO and everything. It's just that the AFO is like a crutch to me. When I'm driving, it seems like I need it. And I drove the other day without it. It's just like I go a little bit slower or this and that. So I put the AFO and I can walk a little bit faster. So I'm just like crutching myself with it. Well, oh, yeah. I'm tired of it. Yeah, yeah, you need to spend AFO. longer. You need to spend more time practicing without it then, just within right. a controlled yes. setting where yes. you're not going to crash a car. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> the other thing is a lot of this is mental in the sense that, um, I, I was saying this to somebody the other day, you know, we tend to recover and then we don't realize that our brain still has us do it the old way. And yeah. what I was going to ask you is, so is that like, kind of like a form of uh, if you're wearing AFO too long is it kind of a form of learned non-use correct yeah so, yeah, it's, so it is. It, it's by virtue of something called the default learning network it's how our brains learn to do things it's habituate things um so I, I, I think um there's, a, there's an experiment of was heard about it's not off topic but it's, it's a strange thing if you if you take a flea uh, that can jump I think it's got like a 47 inch vertical a flea is and if and if you put it in a jar and that flea has infants you know children it, though and you then remove the jar those fleas won't jump higher than six or seven inches even though they're physically capable it's it's because they've habituated and learned oh, wow. to do that, that they, they don't know how to change that that behavior so it's a similar thing with doing too much of with an afo and compensating the gate too much the brain will reinforce pathways that, that sequence that movement where you don't utilize your foot. And the more you do that, the more it will tell the brain that's the right thing to do. Let's keep doing that. Uh, and so when you then try and use your foot, you're trying to redirect the neurological activity somewhere else. And then it's all kind of slows down and it gets all clunky because it's a new learning experience. But then the more that you, what we call potentiate or practice that better way of doing it, then you will slowly remove the habit. It's just about commitment. And like what that what the lady said, the just is it's it's difficult to break the habit because you walk slower or you walk more clunky yeah. and you know, but it's a case of just practice. I, I've I'm had, gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. I found the same thing is true with fear. You know, when the brain yeah. gets locked into these different things, the only thing you can really do is practice enough. The one thing that gets rid of, only thing I've found that gets rid of fear is uh, whatever somebody's afraid of, putting them into a what I call a safe zone where you do it right and, they're, and you're ensuring their safety and you keep them in that zone long enough for their brain to get, you know, readjust to learn the proper way and and get used to the fact that this is the way to do it and it's safe and then the fear and even then it, 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 i mean it, it's i wouldn't be surprised if it takes you know six months or a year to to the, the brain's real slow i'm 14 yeah. years out and uh this came up the other day and i and i gave an example i don't remember it now uh, of 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 this still happening to me you know you get yeah. used to the, what you can and can't do oh, yeah yeah i mean a lot of if you look to our facebook page and because we often paste 
post-patient stories where we follow patients through their rehab journey. So a lot of those where you see the videos and pictures of the patients we're with that are walking almost fine now, or they're learning to just walk without their walking aid, you would think that that would have happened in the first sort of few weeks. But the majority of those patients that you see doing that could have been bed bound for a year or more. And that it's just there is an ability for the brain to do amazing things and relearn at any point with, with enough practice. But I don't think it'll be quick. It won't be overnight. No, 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 no. So, so a lot of a lot of our clients might have been seen for you know before that point where you see that video of look they're walking now and this was when they started with us when they can't walk. That might have been a 10, 11 month journey to get to that point. Right, and I, I, I would encourage Marilyn to do it, and uh, you know, just yes. the reason I'm saying that is not not to discourage you in any way, but when if you have ex, here's the deal if when stroke survivors have expectations they end up with disappointments so it's better to just you know jump into it for the long haul realize it might take a while and then you tend to yeah. be disappointed less because this disappointment is um de is a demotivator it, yeah and you're more likely to give up when you don't reach your own set target right so I always say keep the goals that you have. It's just, it's just, if you think it's, you've still got the same destination in mind, just imagine that the road is a bit longer than what you thought it was going to be, but just stay on the road because the moment you decide to turn back, you'll never get there. So, well, or, or set really small goals. Like if you can walk, you know, yeah. a minute, then try and don't try and walk five minutes. That's not your next goal. Your next goal is. No. Is it's like a minute and a half, and guess yeah. what? If you make it to a minute and a half, your next goal is not to do two minutes the next day. Yeah. It's to say, can I repeat a minute and a half that yeah. I did yesterday? Yeah. That um, success because success builds on success. So when you set small goals, you achieve them, and you play into the whole motivation thing instead of the demotivation thing. At least that's the way it worked for me, and I've. Yeah. Tried to apply this with some other people where it seems to work, or they yeah. are lying to me and being nice. <laughs> and this is this is the, and this is I know this is off topic originally, but it's it's the psychology of the stroke patient. It's to it's to have ownership of your rehab journey, but not so much ownership that you beat yourself up when things don't go the way that you thought they were going to go. I yeah. Use I use both of those things. You know, I, I've everybody here will tell you, I, I say you don't make much progress in your recovery until you take ownership of it. And yeah, but then when you go, I had a bad day because, and it could be completely out of your control. It could be just the virtue of how your symptoms are varied that day. But a lot of patients will go, I'm taking a step backwards and this is frustrating me and it's because I've not worked hard enough and I need to do this for me and my family. And, and it all internalizes into this big, cycle of almost like an anxiety and depression about the whole thing where when actually it's to understand that your brain is just it's just not that simple it, it, you can you can will and you can keep working you can have that willingness but you will have ups and downs the progression of stroke recovery is never linear it's never as as straightforward as how a staircase is laid out or a straight line on a graph you know ultimately you'll improve but you'll have points where you dip below the line of trend and you go above it and then you dip below and then and, and that's normal. So that, that's also quite important to bear in mind. Yeah, I was a stock market didn't have a good day. I was going to try and pull up, you know, something like stock. Yeah, no, it's not a, yeah, yeah. We, maybe a stock, a growth day. stock. Maybe look at something like Google or Nvidia. Maybe look at that trend. Then right. The <laughs> what you do is you look, you, know, you draw a point between where you were and where you are, and you don't worry if it goes up and down. The line goes up and down because you're going to have bad days. What I liked about that was I, I also say, you know, don't beat up on yourself. But what I really liked was the way you put the two of them together. Take ownership of your recovery, but not so much as you beat up on yourself. I love it. I'm stealing yeah. it, but I'll give yes. you credit. Well, you can it. steal that. That's fine. But it's it's very true because um, obviously you could working so closely with, with stroke patients and investing so heavily in them, it's important for me to understand the psychology behind it. And, I, and I, you know, I can never – understand what it's like to have a stroke until god forbid one day i have a stroke you know um but i can only try to 
be around people who've had a stroke for so many hundreds of hours that I can at least get close to understanding. The other um, thing you've got going for you is you're empathetic, period. That goes yeah. a long way. And Billy's a really good judge of character, yeah. by the way. Well, that's good. Yeah. But the thing is, is we, you know, I can imagine what it's, I can imagine what it must be like to lose things that I take for granted. So you've got to try your best to put yourself in those shoes, although you're not walking in them. It's very, it's, it's very much, I can't sit there and go, I know what it's like, because I'm not going to say that because I don't know what it's like. Well, but I know, I know what your feelings are like when different things happen to me. All you so, need is you, you, you care, basically. And by yeah. caring, that you don't have to have a stroke. You're, you're, you're doing what you have to do. And so you don't want a stroke because we need people like you that care. Not, not, not these other guys that, like I said, work from uh, 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock and they forget, forget, forget your name. You see them in the yeah. store. They don't even know you. Yeah. Billy, yeah. you are so right. When I was at the hospital, there was not that many people that they would care for you. They no. just. No. All right. Yeah. Well, anybody else I'm trying to let Tom go to bed? <laughs> Actually, Thank you so I've, got, much. I've, got, I've got emails to answer after this. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really a good session. A lot of information. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't come to sleep. If you work in a restaurant, you know, you get home at two o'clock in the morning and you can't go to sleep because you're all wound up. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, what I probably would say is like the reason I probably need to get off is because I'm, well, we're currently between houses. So, so I've, I've bought a new house. It's not built yet. So, we're in rental accommodation whilst it's being built. But so I'm in the kitchen. So, I can hear my wife wants to come down and make a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> she dare not do it because as soon as the you guys I know you guys don't do kettles or anything, but as soon as a kettle goes on, that thing is so loud. So she's probably right. begging me to stop soon. <laughs> Remember the number one rule of life: happy, yeah, happy wife, life, okay? happy life, happy yeah. life. Yeah, <laughs> very true. <laughs> Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you. You too. You well. Tom. Thank you. Much, Tom. Thank you so much. We are much. going to present Thank the other so slide, much. which yes. is the neurological approach of dealing yeah, with sure. toxicity and and, and sure. how you. I mean, this wasn't negative. I didn't want this to be negative, and it wasn't. We did a good sure, job sure. of keeping it positive, not bashing Botox, giving information, and we also danced around the the solution for two hours. And so we'll bring that to you know what Fine. we'll bring that to you in a few weeks. Yeah. Uh, Great. That would be great. No problem. Tom. Was a very nice session. A lot of information. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. I hope I'll see you soon then. Good night. Bye-bye. Right. Look forward to it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. 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 See you, Tom. <laughs>